welcome back to Haunted and Historic Australia for a fourth episode of the Mysterious Tales from the Land Down Under series. This one is one of Australia's most baffling cases, the disappearance of the men at Boomagui. Making his way on horseback along a strip of the New South Wales south coast on the afternoon of October 10, 1880, William Johnson was searching for likely gold prospecting spots. Suddenly, something else caught his eye. Stranded high and dry on the reef at Mutton Fish Point, about 14 kilometres from the village of Bermagui, was a small green boat lying abandoned and wrecked, but not empty. Stuffed into its hull were five bags, each crammed with personal belongings. Vomit covered the forward part of the boat, a bullet was firmly lodged in its starboard side and lying on the open seat was a book inscribed with the name Lamont Young. The mysterious disappearance of five men who had set out in the boat, including the respected government geologist Lamont Young, while on a peaceful Sunday boating trip from Bermagui, was a complete as unexpected as that of the vanished crew of the Mary Celeste. Police searches, private investigators and a full-scale government inquiry failed to find either bodies or solutions. The Bermagui disappearances were a mystery, fed by wild rumours of drowning, kidnapping and murder. In September 1880, a Canadian prospector, Henry Williams, and three companions made an exciting new discovery. Wash gold was uncovered near the beach about seven kilometres from Bermagui, a small fishing village on the New South Wales south coast. Within weeks there were more than 2,000 hopeful diggers swarming over the gold field, which Williams had christened Montreal after his hometown. Since the first discovery of gold in New South Wales in May 1851, any news of a new find brought miners and townspeople flocking to the spot. Bermagui was no exception. New shops appeared, construction of a hotel and three boarding houses had begun and within a week the town had its own newspaper, the Bermagui Times, and even a small circus. The Sydney Morning Paper soon warned that the fields were becoming seriously overcrowded and that people should wait for the official report of the geological surveyor before setting out on the arduous 390 kilometre journey from Sydney to the field. The surveyor's report, however, was never to appear. Lamont Young, one of the New South Wales Mine Department's three surveyors, was a 29-year-old Englishman. Tall, dark and bearded, he had set out for Bermagui in the company of his field assistant, Max Schneider, a dark-haired and moustached German, with a large scar running down his left cheek. They arrived on the steamer Traganini on Friday, 8 October, 1880, and pitched a tent on Bermagui Heads, south of the Bermagui River. They lunched that day with the Goldfields resident policeman, Constable John Berry, at a nearby eating house. Afterwards, Schneider left to return to camp. He was never to be seen again. Following lunch, Young visited various people around the diggings. At six o'clock that evening, a man named Henderson saw him back to Bermagui, striding through a paddock towards his tent. Young was never seen again. Early on Sunday morning, 10th of October, several people in Bermagui saw a green fishing boat known to belong to a Batemans Bay man, Thomas Towers, with at least four men in it, sailing out of the mouth of the Bermagui River. Towers, accompanied by two other men, William Lloyd and Daniel Casey, was returning north after coming down for a quick look at the diggings. He had reportedly promised to give the surveyor and his assistant a lift to some more diggings a short distance up the coast near Corona Point, known locally as Mutton Fish Point. 
At about 11 a.m. that same day, William Johnson saw the green boat out at sea. With a fair wind blowing and its sails set, he was amazed to see that the boat remained stationary. His curiosity aroused, Johnson examined the open boat closely and concluded that there was just one person in it. So that same afternoon, riding along the beach at Muttonfish Point, he was again astonished to see the boat stranded on the rocks, this time without a soul in sight. Constable Berry, John Hobbs, the Montreal Mining Registrar, and Henry Keatley, warden of the Bermagui Goldfields, were the first to be called in to officially examine the mysterious vessel. They were puzzled by what they found. Dry vomit lay in the forward area. A bullet was lodged in the boat's side and lying in the hull were five bags filled with clothing. Scientific books and private papers belonging to Young. But more strangely still, there were two paddles strapped to the seat of the boat, a small blue bottle, almost full of a dark liquid, and on the floor a sack of potatoes, several very heavy stones, and a single fisherman's boot. Yet all of this, Keatley amazingly reported that he could find nothing which indicated that anything of an unusual nature had taken place on board. Such an attitude set the general tone of the inquiries to follow. It was another four days before a search for the still missing men began. Thirty men tramped up and down the beach, boring holes in the sand with rods, inspecting nearby caves and dynamiting the largest holes in the rocks in the hope of throwing up the bodies. However, no bodies were found on the land, in the caves or in the surrounding water. But on the beach near the wrecked boat, the remains of a fire, food and three shirt studs were uncovered. Wild stories about the disappearances were spreading through the diggings. In the Sydney press though, the story had to compete with the news about the Melbourne International Exhibition and the ongoing trial of Ned Kelly. At one stage, panic spread among the diggers when a rumour went around that John Thomas Sullivan, the infamous New Zealand murderer, had been seen at Montreal. Sullivan had been a member of a gang of four who moved around the gold fields, living by theft, burglary and hold-ups. In 1866, they had committed a series of murders and were all sentenced to death. Sullivan's sentence had been commuted to life, however, and in 1874 he had been pardoned. Disguised in a flaxen wig and moustache, he had been shipped back to England only to reappear months later in Melbourne. The authorities, anxious now for any possible lead, investigated the Sullivan sightings, but decided they were unfounded. Meanwhile in London, General Young, the surveyor's father, had become convinced that the five missing men had been kidnapped and told his suspicions to the colonial secretary who passed them on to the New South Wales authorities. General Young had read stories in a Sydney journal about men being kidnapped to work as seamen aboard sailing ships, a practice known in the colonies as crimping. The policeman now in charge of the investigations, Inspector General Fosbury, thought this highly unlikely and gave a written assurance to General Young that sailors in Sydney were now quite plentiful. So with little progress made on the Bermagui mystery, the matter was finally put before a select committee of the Legislative Assembly on 12 October 1883. It sat for eight days and questioned 16 witnesses. The first question to be raised was whether or not the whole business was simply a case of accidental drowning. On 26 October 1880, the Sydney Morning Herald had reported that a small strip of shirting and a small quantity of what is supposed to be human entrails had been washed up on Mutton Fish Point, leading to the belief that sharks might have quickly devoured any floating bodies. Informed witnesses, however, dismissed any possibility of accidental drowning. 
The sea was calm that day, and the deserted boat was still full of the men's belongings when first discovered. It had clearly not capsized, so there remained only one possibility. The five men must have been foully and diabolically murdered, as the Illustrated Sydney News had, had suggested. The select committee, however, had a little hope of pinpointing the culprit or culprits. It was three years since the alleged atrocity, and any possible leads would have dried up long ago. As well, there didn't seem to be any real motive. The memories of the main witnesses were apparently rusty, and obvious discrepancies in their statements were incredibly ignored by the committee. In fact, it wasn't until four years had passed that the Sydney police decided to circulate a photo of Max Schneider to all police headquarters in Australia, Britain, America and New Zealand. Over the years, there had been several reported sightings of the scar-faced German, which, when investigated, had always proved misleading. It was mainly the absence of any convincing suspect and some vague stories about bad debts in Sydney that led the police to hunt for Schneider. Yet despite all efforts, he was never traced. In June 1898, a policeman, Constable Collier, recently assigned to the Bermagui district, claimed that he had the solution to the mystery. After conducting many interviews with locals in the area, he had been told about a character who had been living there in 1880, Edmund Reader. Mr Adams, the local butcher, had met Reader on a train in 1882 when he had touched on the subject of the Bermagui mystery. Reader had jumped, startled from his seat and replied, What about it? What do you mean? After tracing Reader's movements at the time and finding that he had suddenly and stealthily left the district on 11th of October 1880, the day following the disappearances, Collier's suspicions were aroused. Delving further, he discovered that Reader was always regarded as a man suffering under a sense of some great personal injury connected with his wife and daughter in England. He had talked often of taking revenge on an unnamed enemy. Sydney Police Headquarters, however, refused to even consider the detailed reports supplied by Constable Collier. It was simply dismissed as the imaginings of a too fertile brain. So, just when the investigators of the disappearances of 1880 finally had a convincing suspect in their sights, after 18 years of frustrating dead ends, they declared the file on the Bermagui mystery officially closed. Over the last hundred years, there have been many theories as to what went down on that day that the men went missing. In addition to that of Edmund Reader, as well as the New Zealand murderer, John Thomas Sullivan. There is also a case of the woman who on her deathbed stated that her husband may have given assistance to Max Schneider after he committed the murders. He was ordered in the middle of the night at gunpoint to take a man with broken English in his punt across the Taurus River. At gunpoint, he was so intimidated he did what the man wished and also kept quiet about it until his death, where he told his wife. She held on to it too until her death, possibly fearing that the man may come back and kill them. The words of a barmaid in Sydney, some time after the murders, or alleged murders, stated that a man that she'd bunked with had told her or said something to the effect that he had something to do with it. After their relationship fell through, she went to police, but nothing was ever found as well as a man who stated that he came into contact with the ghost of Lamont Young. And the ghost had told him that they were indeed murdered and buried near a black stump. Police were given this information too, and did some searching at the time, but found no black stump, nor any of the bodies. Today still, you can find many a conversation on forums and on YouTube videos 
of what people believe happened to the Bermagui Five, those men who disappeared at Bermagui, never to be found again. Three men who were from the area, they knew the water and could not have easily drowned, as well as Lamont Young, who was said to have been an experienced swimmer. Many believe it was foul play. There really is no substantial evidence in this case, and this is why it is still unsolved. Did Max Schneider murder his companion, as well as the locals from the area, in their boat and get away with various items that were expensive that Lamont Young was carrying with him, as well as some money amongst the other three? And did he take off demanding pass at Taros River, heading north and making his way possibly back to Germany? Well, your guess is as good as ours. We have no idea and that's why it's unsolved. But we hope you enjoyed this episode. We've got many more mysteries to tell, so definitely stay tuned. Don't forget to like, subscribe and share and comment below if you have your own theory as to what happened to the Bermagui Five. Scoob. <laughs> now that's what I call hacking. Hacking and Scooby snacking. Scooby dooby doo. <laughs> <laughs>